My name is Dr. Beverly Goodman. I'm a marine geoarchaeologist. I'm an associate professor at the University of Haifa, and I'm also a National Geographic explorer. Broadly, my research addresses the interrelationship between people and the coastline. So what I'm dealing with is all sorts of natural changes, whether they're gradual or rapid, things like sea level change, erosion, tsunamis, uh, building harbors, infrastructure, and seeing how people affect their environment and also how the environment affects them. And I'm looking not only at today, but also trying to understand it over a much longer time period. A few years ago, when we were doing some work in Caesarea, we came across our first evidence for a tsunami event in the sediments. The evidence that we found for the tsunami actually came from an event sometime in the 2nd century AD. And we went into the tsunami catalog, which is a list of events that historians and geologists have found in written records that they've, they've transferred over time onto this catalog list. And within that list, there was an event that had about the same timing as the layer that we had found. And when I looked into it, it was a story that came from the Talmud, and it's a story about rabbis essentially arguing, or a rabbi arguing, over whether or not an oven is kosher, and then the other rabbis disagreeing. So in the course of the story, the rabbi who is trying to convince them that this is a kosher oven draws into it all sorts of signs. He says, you know, what if this happens and what if that happens? Will you believe me then? And the examples that he brings in are things like, if I can make the trees move from here to there, will you agree with me? And he makes the trees move. And then later he says, what if the walls move? And the walls move. And each time the rabbis are saying, well, trees don't decide and walls don't decide. We're the ones that interpret the law. We're the ones that decide whether or not you have a kosher oven. And the next example he gives is actually water flowing the opposite direction. And again, the rabbis don't agree. And ultimately, the rabbis explain that the law is made in the heavens. God gives man the law and they're there to interpret it. So... That's a story that's, that's fairly well known. It's very important in terms of Jewish law and discussion and argument. But what happened that made the historian add this into the tsunami catalog was the after story. And the after story is that one of the rabbis is out on a small boat and a little wave goes underneath his boat and then it grows until a large wave hits and destroys Caesarea and Yavne. So this is what the historian read that made them think, oh, wow, we have something here that could be a tsunami-related reference. So what was really interesting is that many geologists did not consider this entry into the catalog as something that was reliable because the original story is a folklore story. But it turns out that it is, in fact, the event that most closely fits the timing of this event, and it also happened to be the only event that we had any physical evidence for. So I've been thinking about this story, and... What then struck me was that the entire story actually could be explained by natural events. If you think about it, when you talk about trees moving across a landscape, when you have an earthquake event, those trees, especially along a fault line, will actually look as if they've moved. But of course, they haven't moved. The, the ground that they're, they're growing into has moved. Or if you have walls being tilted, this could be something that occurs during the course of an earthquake and the water running backwards. This is another example that can be either because of an earthquake or it can also be because of a tsunami. When the tsunami water inundates over the landscape, it can actually force water the other direction if it's inside any kind of channel like a river or a sewage system or pipelines. It can actually make the water, force the water in the other direction. The story was already in the tsunami catalog, so certainly the historian that came across it who was thinking about earthquakes and tsunamis was already thinking about the connection between this story. I was certainly the first person that had evidence for a tsunami on the shoreline and to connect it to that story. Seashells have so much that they can teach us. In regards to the research that, that we've been doing, what happened was that the first deposit that we found was absolutely chock full of shells. But what was unusual about these seashells is that 
we had to understand where did they come from because you know every every shell every shell that you see on the beach every shell that you find underwater living or dead it has a story to tell and you know there these things are born they grow they eat they they're, they have a certain environment that they live in, and eventually they die, and, and there's still a story that continues after they die. And in the case of these seashells, what we realized was that the type of shells that we found in these layers didn't live anywhere near where we found them. So if they're not living there and they somehow got there, we need to understand, okay, where do they live? And if they're living far away, how'd they get to where we found them? In fact, that was really how we began to understand the entire interpretation of these of these layers. And it turns out that after we analyzed the shells and we determined where they probably lived, they actually lived six to seven kilometers away from where we found them. So this was super exciting and of course was nice because it, it reinforced this uh, interpretation that it was a tsunami deposit. But the thing that was so amazing is it got me to thinking, oh my goodness, these shells are everywhere all along the Israeli beaches. There are many, many beaches that are simply covered in these exact same shells. So if they're coming from that far from the beach and they're not living anywhere in the shallow and they're certainly not living on the beaches, does that mean that all of these shells perhaps are actually telling us this long history of tsunami events? That each time a tsunami event, event happens, these shells are being brought in from the deep they're being deposited either on the beach or in shallower water. And eventually with storms and with reworking, we're ending up with these gorgeous shelly beaches. But it's just such a cool thought to think that all along people are playing on these beaches, that they're hiking along these beaches, walking all over these things. And in fact, right underneath our feet is this entire story of the tsunamis that happened in the region. When we find the layers, we're able to use the shell to do radiocarbon dating. But we have to be careful because, as you can see from all of these beaches, you get shell that's deposited and then it can survive. It can stick around for a long time. So what we do is in the tsunami layers, here and there, we tend to get lucky and we find both sides of the shell, both sides of the clam. And what that tells us is that the clam actually was alive, at least very close to the time that it was buried because it, if it had died, it eventually would have been broken apart as it was being transported and then you wouldn't have the two sides together. But somehow it means that we found an individual that managed to survive the transport alive or died in the transport but didn't break apart. And then it, the burial time gives us also around the time of its death and that will also give us the age of the event. So we're able to use them. Sometimes we also can find other materials inside the deposit that we can use to confirm that age. But generally speaking, we found that it gives us a really good date. Most definitely, one of the most satisfying and exciting things about this research is that it really gives us an opportunity to make differences for now and for the future. We can't control how big the tsunami is going to be. We can't control when it's going to happen. There's lots of things that we have absolutely no control over. But by knowing that these events happened in the past, we're able to increase the education so that people know how to respond when they hear that there's a warning or that they see signs that a tsunami is, is about to happen. And also, we can help to mitigate the damages by being smarter about the kind of things that we put on the coastline and how we build into the future. And for things that are already on the coastline, we can at least sort of reduce potential harm that's going to happen should a tsunami occur. The research that we're doing on this coastline also has a lot of relevance for other parts of the world. So the concerns that we have in Israel are not so different than the kind of concerns that you might have on the California coastline or any other coastline in the world. What we've learned is that, especially places like harbors or where there's sensitive infrastructure, it's really important to know what kind of events occurred in the past, just to know if at all there's any sort of reason to be concerned about tsunamis or there aren't. For example, in the Mediterranean, we're super lucky because we've got this long written history um, while it might not be exact and it, it might not be incredibly detailed, at least we have the red flag that these things have happened. Other parts of the world where you don't have a long written or a, a well-preserved oral history, they might not even be aware that they actually are at risk. 
So one of the big concerns today is that there are many, many areas in the world where you have rapid population growth but concentrated on the coastlines, especially in places where there was no population in the past. And so what this means is that it's very unlikely that there's any sort of written or oral history about the tsunami events there. We don't even know without doing this kind of research whether or not they need to be concerns. So the only way to overcome this problem is to get out there and to do the field work and to do the research similar to what we're doing here in order to determine whether there's presence or absence of these events to make sure that the place prepares for any potential future events.